pilots, hello friends of aviation, Cirrus pilots. This is Elliot Flersch with Barrow Aviation and Airflow Aviation. Today we're going to be going to uh, fly the typical instrument checkride for Cirrus aircraft. This is going to be one of three videos for the Practical Pilot Series uh, instrument videos. We'll be starting off flying the GPS runway 35 approach into Columbia with a partial panel. We're going to be simulating a dual attitude and heading reference system failure. This is going to be hand flown as the dual failure does not allow for the use of the attitude based GFC 700 autopilot. So on the check ride this is typically the only approach that needs to be hand flown depends on the examiner. Uh, but we'll be circling the land on this first one. And then the second approach we're going to do is, uh, is typically part of uh, the instrument check ride for the Bay Area, the VOR runway 29 right into Stockton, followed by the ILS 29 right at Stockton. Uh, both of those will be with vectors to final, and then they're going to be followed up by the published missed approach procedure. So what we're going to start with now is we're going to uh, brief the ATIS and make sure that we've got favorable winds for this first approach and uh, talk about circle to land if that becomes necessary. And so we start off with our IFR checklist and we run through uh, checking the METAR for Columbia. And currently Columbia, you can see on the PFD, we've got a timestamp here, 29th of April, 1555 Zulu. Uh, looks like that was about 25 minutes ago, so that's a valid timestamp. Automated weather observation, winds are calm, so we'll circle to land just, just for the uh, sake of demonstration. And then we've got 10 miles visibility, which is obviously good enough for this approach procedure, and it's up to our standards as far as personal limitations go. Sky's clear. Temperature 142.08, and it's uh, morning time, temperatures are coming up, so that temperature dew point spread is widening, generally means the conditions are getting better. It's always good to look at that for trend information. And we've got an altimeter setting of 3001. As you can see, that's already set over on the PFD. Uh, so the first several lines here of the IFR checklist that we keep on our dash uh, are complete. And uh, we're not going to receive radar vectors for this one. So really, our, our stick acronym is complete. We've got it sourced to GPS. We've got it tuned for our first waypoint of the approach, which is Habsu intersection. We've got it identified as the top part of uh, our display on our primary flight display. And we've got uh, the course confirmed, and we can check all the remaining courses afterwards, 080 from Habsu to Rido, and 357 all the way through the approach until the mist. We want to also brief all the altitudes for the uh, for this approach and cross check those against our approach plate. Uh, we've got the approach plate in a uh, iPad four flight display mini uh, that's suction mounted to the windshield makes it real easy for cockpit resource management. And so we go ahead and brief that whole chart and we just brief it top to bottom. And we start off by uh, talking about the runway length which is 4,300 feet. We've got a touchdown zone elevation of 2105. Uh, circling is not authorized to the east of runway 17 and 35, so we want to make sure we brief that as there's a lot of hazardous terrain on that side, so we would be making right traffic during this circle of land for runway 17. Other things that we can catch from this DME, DME RNP.3 is not authorized. We've got GPS uh, that we're going to be using in lieu of uh, RNAV on this approach. And that is, uh, of course, authorized. And then visibility reduction for helicopters. We don't worry about missed approach procedure. Is a climbing left-hand turn to 7,000 to Hapsu and then go into a holding pattern. Looks like a teardrop or a parallel entry. Uh, as you choose, and then continue and hold. Uh, AWOS, we've already briefed that. We'll listen to it again as we get a little closer, maybe. And then uh, we've got all the frequencies set. 122.975 is ready to go for Unicom. All those altitudes are briefed on the plan view, 
which is the middle of the chart, and then the profile view as well. And we've got the minimum set in our timer reference there. 3240 is set above the NOTAM. We've got a NOTAM out for uh, some obstacles, hazards, uh, that bring the minimums up to 3140. I like to set 3240 just so that uh, you get a little heads up alert when you're 100 feet to minimums. And this is, uh, this is really helpful on the check ride to make sure that uh, pilots don't accidentally bust through their minimums. So during the circle land, we'll be trying to keep our altitude between the 3240 number and the 3140 number as we're allowed to be plus 100 minus zero per the instrument rating practical test standards. And now we're, it uh, looks like 13 miles from Habsu. The altitude after Hebsu is uh, 4,500, so we'll have uh, 1,000 feet to lose during that leg, and we're four minutes away from Hebsu. So what I'm going to do is uh, disable the attitude and heading reference system. Typically, what we do is, as instructors, is we just pull one circuit breaker, and that'll be the AHARS one circuit breaker. And so you can see what that looks like. We've got a heading, roll, and pitch, no comp, uh, meaning that there's uh, there's no additional computer, no comparison that can be made of one AHARS to the other. You've only got one magnetometer running, and so it's unable to uh, determine uh, whether there's one that's erroneous since it's only working with, uh, with one. It can't compare. So we're using AHARS 2. The first thing that I like students to do is if this fails, I want to see that they know how to switch to the other ARs. So you would have to go into the sensor subpage, and then within sensor, you'd have to switch to the other ARs and see if that did the trick. But we're going to simulate that both are failed. All right. And so now, what's happened with our latest software update? You guys all want to make sure that you're flying an airplane that's got the latest software. Uh, it just makes things so much easier for the instrument check ride to have a full heading reference system. I call it a track reference system now because that's basically what it is. You can see the little X out on the heading. That means that we are actually displaying track information so you don't even have to think about the wind anymore. Uh, you just fly your track right straight up above your GPS course. It could be 50 knots of wind and you wouldn't even know it. Uh, you're just keeping your track right on target. And uh, that's basically what the autopilot does for you when it's engaged. But uh, we're going to go ahead and climb back up there to 5,500 now. And we're going to say that we've been cleared for this approach. And we're going to start slowing down so that we're in the proper speed range so we can get flaps in and be uh, fully established uh, for this approach. The sooner you can get those flaps out of the way, uh, the sooner you get trimmed up and get stabilized, and that's just going to make your uh, check ride a lot easier. This airplane, uh, really any airplane uh, that's out there, is going to feel a lot more stable if you're at um, uh, your typical approach speeds with a notch of flaps in because uh, when you're using that standby attitude indicator uh, down below, it, um, should I tilt this down so you can see that? With that standby attitude indicator, it's, um, it's important to not be three degrees above the horizon. That notch of flaps will help you with that. So as you can see, my student's having a little bit of a hard time holding his altitude, and it's because the attitude needs to be held so high with no flaps that uh, there's a tendency for people to fly a little bit too low. So go ahead and put in those flaps there, buddy. And you'll see the lift that comes out of that. We'll drop the nose a little lower. So the hub of his scan is the attitude indicator, which uh, you're unable to see on this video. But you... Uh, you want to make sure that uh, your scan is going from that hub up to your MFD and over to your altitude, your track indicator, 
and your airspeed and just kind of moving from attitude up to altimeter back to attitude down to the track indicator down to attitude up to airspeed indicator down to attitude up to track angle error and cross track information and so that's your new hub and spoke scan and so this typically ends up being the hardest part of the instrument check ride because of the fact that uh, you've spent very little of your time scanning in this fashion and so you have to completely learn the new scan uh, using these new scan procedures uh, with uh, your attitude indicator displaced down below. Okay, so here we are. We've been cleared for the approach. We're at Habsu at 5,500. We're holding our altitude, and we're going to go ahead and make a turn here. You can see up at the top it says turn right, heading, I think it was 080. Turn now. We're going to hold that 5,500 until we've turned to that new course, and now we can start dropping down to that next course altitude. So uh, my student is going to power back here to his normal 500 foot per minute power setting. On this airplane, that's 20% power. So the pack or the power attitude and configuration for this section, altitude. that 500 foot per minute segment, is power 20, attitude a couple degrees below the horizon, and configuration one notch of flaps. When he gets down to 4,500, and he's setting that now to the segment altitude that he's flying, when he gets down to about 4,600, he needs to power up. So he's going to go back to his pre-approach level power setting, which will be 35% at 4,600 feet. Okay, so we've got 500 to go. And when we make the turn at Rideau, we're going to start making some calls to the Columbia Common Traffic Advisory Frequency. Right now we're on guard frequency just because we don't want a lot of chatter coming in from NorCal. But normally you'd be on with NorCal. They'd issue your uh, clearance for the practice GPS approach. And off you go. All right, 4,800, descending 4,500. We're about two minutes from Rideau intersection, so he's going to have a little bit of time to level off here. You can see he's keeping his course right on center line, and really the key is having that heading indicator or the heading bug right above our course and having his track right in the middle of that blue heading bug. That'll keep him dead on center through all of his turns. All right, looking good. Back to 35, so he's at the level flight power setting. <coughs> He'll use this again during the circle land. When he gets within 100 feet of minimums, he's going to power up to 35, but on the circle land, he needs to make sure that he doesn't go through that minimum altitude. At this portion of the approach, he's allowed plus or minus 100 feet. So 4,500 plus 100 minus zero. So he's just trying to kind of hang in there, plus or minus 50, trying to keep it as tight as he can. And this is all looking really good. So at this point, now he's, uh, he's briefed his entire approach. He's briefed the ATIS. The things that he wants to be thinking about on this next segment, as he makes the turn at Rideau, see that terminal mode? Needs to switch to the approach mode that is estimated for the approach. So you can see LNAV plus V is what we expect to get during this uh, Garmin approach. Uh, Garmin Avionics add in the plus V function quite nicely, giving you a glide path that'll clear Keck D, that next intersection, right at the proposed altitude. All right, so it says to turn left, so he's going to go to, into a standard rate turn. So he looks down at his standby attitude indicator, and he looks for your typical 15 to 20 degree bank that gives you a standard rate turn. And once he rolls out on that new heading, he's going to power back to that descent profile that's going to hold him on the uh, proper angle for this approach. 
So this is a three degree angle. It's always important to look at that angle on the approach procedure so that you know what power setting to set. So we don't really know what the wind is, but we can assume 20 to start. So we start off with 20% since that's our typical headwind power setting for a 500 foot per minute descent. And he's going to go down to 3,400. Now you could stay up there at 4,500 and wait for the glide path up there, but um, he's going to go ahead and head on down to 3,400. Uh, typically, if you're coming into an airport like Hayward, they like you to get down quickly and out of the way. But out here, when there's nobody around, uh, they'll typically uh, be fine with you flying it either way. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and switch over to common traffic advisory frequency, and we're going to make some calls. And we're going to use the information up here on the MFD. We can see that we're eight miles out, so we just call ourselves on an eight-mile final for runway 35 and will be a circle to land to runway 17. All right, so we're heading down to 3,400. I'll make that first call. Columbia traffic, Sirius 415, Papa Whiskey, 3,900, descending seven mile final, runway 35 on the GPS approach. We'll be circling runway 17, Columbia. Okay, so we don't hear anything back, but um, uh, it's pretty early in the morning, so those guys haven't gotten around to doing their flight training yet. All right, looking good. So now we want to be doing our gumps check, right? We don't want to forget our standard operating procedures, our before landing checklist, that kind of thing. So if uh, if we don't have an autopilot, it's pretty hard for us to pull out the checklist and brief that. So we're going to do a gumps in lieu of the checklist at this point, and that's going to confirm that we've got the gas on fullest tank undercarriage. Uh, we do a lot of simulation of... Uh, of landing gear procedures, so if, if we're simulating that, we'd simulate that the gear is down, we've got three greens, uh, but if you're not simulating that, you just use that portion for a brake check. So gas, undercarriage, brake check, mixture goes rich, pump on, switches and safety belts, we brief our passengers and make sure everybody's buckled up. This may be an emergency procedure, but we still want to make sure we're following all our normal standard operating procedures. Okay, so here we are at 3,400. We're allowed plus or minus 100 on this, but the only way for us to maintain that is if we power up. Uh, there we go. Now we've actually gotten to the glide path, and so we can continue descending now. So we'll pull the power back again to 20% and we'll continue down that glide path. At this point, you'd want to make sure your gear was down if you had that. Columbia traffic, Cirrus is on a four mile final for runway 35. We'll be circling runway 17, Columbia. Okay, so we're letting that nose down, getting down onto that glide path, and we're taking it down to our barrel minimums of 3240. Minimums. So right here, minimums. we power up. Good. And hopefully we've got the airport in sight. Okay, so we've got the airport in sight. I'm going to give him his full panel back just because it's cruel and unusual punishment to make somebody do a circle to land with no um, AHARS. So he's got his AHARS back, and he's supposed to maintain 3140 plus 100 minus zero during this procedure. So he's going to continue on center line a little bit to the right. And he's going to, you can see the airport out there on the PFD, and we've zoomed into a three mile scale, and that really helps a lot with his, uh, his whole procedure here. And keeps positional awareness. Once he's within 1.4 of the runway or so, 1.5, he can break off and start his circle. Uh, he's now entered the protected area, and that protected area allows him to uh, deviate from the center of the course. We we'll usually deviate about 30 degrees, and just a nice gradual uh, correction out towards the downwind. Columbia traffic, Sirius is entering right downwind runway 17, Columbia. All right, so he's still at 35% power because he's trying to maintain level flight, and... Now he's looking for three quarters of a mile wide, and you can see on the MFD that he's gotten himself out to about three quarters, so now he's going to go parallel to the runway alignment. So he's going to go over here to that course line there.
3140 or above. Good. All right. So now he's approximately the correct width here, and he's in a good position to start his descent portion. So during the descent portion on this airplane, we're going to set 15% power, and we're going to put in full flaps, and he's just going to let the nose down at about 4 degrees down. We're going to try to maintain Altitude. about 90 knots here. Now he wants to go until he's a 45 from the runway. He's almost there. Right about here, he starts his turn. And this is all a visual maneuver. So his eyes are supposed to be outside throughout this entire maneuver. But when his eyes are inside looking at his airspeed, he wants to also be picking up the other cues that will help him to um, make sure he's at the right width. During reduced visibilities or night operations, it's really important to be able to understand how to use these avionics to assist with the uh, circle to land procedure. All right, so he's looking good. Columbia Traffic Service is right base, turning final 17 Columbia. Okay, and we're going to be a full stop, and we're going to taxi back after this. So now he's got himself lined up. Now he can go ahead 500. and make some corrections as far as his height and speed. So he's going to pull the power to idle here. And we're looking on Vazzy, but he's at 90 knots, so he's going to hold the power back until he can get his speed to his normal kind of 77 uh, approach speed across the numbers. All right, looking great. Just uh, right on center line, looking good on our height. And now we're going to start slowing our descent rate, gradually trimming as necessary, and bringing that nose higher and higher. Once we touch down, we'll go ahead and raise the flaps, and we'll start braking for... Not this taxiway, but the next one. Good deal. Nice job. That's not an easy one. That's really probably the hardest part of the instrument check ride, is that whole procedure followed by a circle to land. Most people don't get enough practice on the circle to land procedure during their instrument rating. So uh, it's something that I like to really emphasize, make sure people are good at. All right, let's go ahead and continue the taxi back. I'll take the controls. You can go ahead and set up your departure procedure. So now we've gotten to the point where really this is the beginning of the check, check ride for a lot of students. There's a really great examiner up here at the Columbia Airport, and uh, there's also um, a great one over there at the Calaveras Airport. And they'll start with flying the departure procedure out of those airports, followed by a couple approaches into Stockton, and then uh, coming back via the GPS partial panel into either Calaveras or Columbia.